All right. So, hello, everyone. Um, in the agenda, it says that uh, I was I was supposed to to be joined by my colleague uh, Fabian, uh, but he could not come because of logistics reasons. So, if you came here just to listen to him, you will be disappointed. So, my talk is called uh, LLVM meets code property graphs, and today I want to talk about this thing, like what is code property graphs and its application in the security and uh, software analysis domain. So a few words about me, uh, if you want to, to find out more, uh, there is a blog, I'm on Twitter, and also you can drop me an email if you have any questions uh, and such. So I work for a company called Shift Left Security, and we are basically building the tools for custom static code analysis. So my responsibility there is to make it work with LLVM, so that we can handle languages like C, C++, and, and so on, like more, more of them. So before we start, I'm... Yeah, I want to ask you some questions. Uh, can you see a problem with this code? Anyone? Just shout, like. Yeah, double free, nice. So it was like four seconds. Um, can you see a problem with this code? Use after free, yeah, that was actually faster, but. Um, can you see a problem with this code? <laughs> So apparently you can, if you, if, you get, uh, if you have enough time and power, you can probably spend some ages and to analyze it manually to see how it works and so on, but yeah, that's not practical. Therefore, we kind of have to use some tooling and to gently ask machines to help us with, with this task. So I want to show you some demo. So uh, this is the basic example. The first one was double free, like how do you find it with, with the tooling? So first, you need to create, uh, to load this program into memory and uh, yeah, so that you can, can run some queries to analyze it. Then it's actually very easy. It's, yeah, it's an easy example. Um, yeah, so to find double free, uh, we just need, uh, from like data flow perspective, we just need to find a flow from one free call uh, to the other one, where the parameter is the same. So we have a source which is the parameter of the free, and we also have a sync that is also parameter to the, the function free. So now, if, if I run, like show me all the flows from sync to source, yeah, then it doesn't work because I forgot one thing, all flows, yeah, here we are. So it says that uh, the first call is uh, at line 6 in file M and the second one at line 8. So you can run more sophisticated queries for that, but uh, we'll get to it in a moment. Yeah, so this uh, tool is basically built on this idea of code property graphs, and uh, before that I have to make a step back and talk about the property graphs in general. So I assume that you probably all know what the graph is, uh, if not, so basically you have some set of nodes, and those nodes are connected with just some edges, like some by some means. And the property graph, it's basically an extension of a graph, or uh, it's also called multigraph, where the nodes, they may have uh, several uh, edges connected, like two nodes may be connected by several edges. And those edges and nodes as well, they may have a number of uh, properties, basically like key value things. Yeah, and the CPG, the code property graph, uh, it takes uh, several representations of the program. Uh, namely, it combines uh, AST, it combines the control flow graph and uh, program dependence graph. So, in the end, uh, basically you have this multigraph somewhere in memory or not, and normally uh, there are tools like Neo4j or Apache something that uh, allow you to work with, the, with those graphs. So basically you can just run some queries, like if you do with uh, SQL, you can just like select from blah blah, and this is basically uh, what, what happens here in this, in this example. So we just run queries uh, against the database. So the beautiful part of the Scott property graph, or at least this implementation of it, that uh, it's kind of multi-layered thing. So at the very, uh, on this example, at the very low level, you have just like rough database representation, and it's not really nice to work with as a human being, because you just need to write lots of boilerplate uh, for, for some things. 
So for the code property graph, uh, there is another level that uh, adds some more like syntactic sugar so that you can run some simple queries and uh, find more information. There are more uh, overlays and all of them are, uh, they are domain specific. So for example, in our application, uh, there are some uh, specific overlays for web applications saying that, okay, you have Basically, you just like load the CPG into the uh, program and then you run a query like show me all uh, SQL injections and it shows the flows from uh, API root to, to some, some place in the code where the SQL injection may, may happen and it may be exploited by the user. Yeah, so if you're familiar with LLVM or Clank or, and its architecture, then uh, you will recognize this uh, slide basically. So what CPG is, it's just another intermediate representation that uh, just presents the program. So at the front end uh, there is a number of, uh, yeah, number of front ends for each language so that uh, they emit the CPG and then CPG is being used by the back end. So currently, uh, yeah, originally uh, we were using the Neo4j it's the graph database, but it's like too general and it just uh, doesn't really fit the, our needs and it's, it, it was too slow. Because if you want to, to analyze some big projects and you, you should load the whole database in the memory and for some projects it may require like hundreds or tens of gigabytes. So an overflow DB is just uh, the same graph database that uh, stores the information it, it loads the information lazily, and if it, not, if it doesn't need anything, it just can uh, overflow it on the disk. So basically, if you don't have enough memory on your machine, you can still use it, but uh, you pay with performance because of the swaps with the disk. So and what, what I've shown, this uh, command line tool, it's called Ocular. There is a counterpart, uh, it's called Yorn. So the Yorn is the open source part. It's, uh, it's yeah, mainly targeted for C and C++ and it's using the fuzzy C uh, front end and fuzzy means that uh, it's not real uh, compiler front end, it just sort of uh, set of uh, regular expressions. It's, yeah, it's, it's more complicated than that, than that but uh, that's yeah, not important. The ocular is more, uh, it's a commercial tool. Uh, but it's very similar to Yorn, it, its capabilities, but it has just more overlays for domain specific things like, uh, I know, some enterprise apps and customers and such. So my goal today is to talk more about the LLVM to CPG. So originally the project was born because uh, we have some customers and clients, they use fuzzy C to CPG, but it's not quite good for when it comes to C++ or when you want to get some better uh, idea of a program. Uh, it has some advantages, like you don't have to compile the code, you can just run, run it on some source files and it will just work. But, so there were many requests to, to add better support for C and C++, so this is how LLVM CPG started. The question that I'm always uh, getting when I talk about this stuff, that uh, why it's LLVM to CPG and not Clang to CPG? Because, I mean, it's, it's like, obvious that uh, you can get much better uh, information from the source code. And if you go to the LLVM level, you lose some information. So we acknowledge that, uh, but we also were curious about some other parts, like what are the other advantages and disadvantages. And the other one is integration. It's arguable, but in my opinion, it's much easier to get LLVM bit code than connect uh, some Clank tool to archaic build system or let's say some uh, Xcode projects on macOS platform. Yeah, the other part that supported languages. So uh, if we want, let's say, yeah, it's, it's very common on uh, macOS platform that Objective-C code mixed with Swift. For that, you cannot use just Clank. You would have to, or we would have to combine Swift compiler and Clank compiler and somehow cooperate with this. But uh, because of the LLVM, like as a baseline, we can just uh, use multiple uh, source languages in, in, one, in one place. And also the language feature set. So C, C++, Objective-C combined, they are just huge. We could have built the support for that, but it would probably take several years. And with LLVM, it's much, much smaller. Uh, that basically means that the time to market is, is much faster. Yeah, so these are, these are the conclusions. Um, some of them, yeah, arguable, but that's the state, current state. 
Yeah, so the strategy was that uh, we take LLVM bit code as a baseline and then uh, basically oriented by feedback, we just, uh, yeah, basically customers say, okay, we don't see something in Objective-C code and we just add support for that. And we are driven, driven by feedback in this case. So previously I mentioned that uh, we have AST, right? The part of the CPG is AST, but we kind of don't have that at LLVM level. Uh, but still we can mimic it. So on the left there is a very simple function identity that just takes a parameter and returns it and on the right you can see the LLVM bit code that just not optimized does, does the same. So first we uh, made kind of assumption that okay we'll treat every LLVM instruction as a function call. So it's, it's not really useful uh, for especially for the user for human beings who use the tool because they just it just doesn't make sense, like loads and stores, like it's basically working on the assembly level, not as nice. Um, so then we applied some, um, yeah, made some, some other assumptions and basically, okay, uh, we specialized some of those instructions and basically load and store, they are just assignments with um, indirection, so that we could build uh, in the end from, from this uh, bit code, we could build the AST that looks like this, so it's not, one-to-one uh, -one mapping, just, just as an example. Uh, then with this AST, we could build the add CFG connections. Yeah, and with this code, we can, uh, now it's full, now it's complete, and we can run some things, uh, some queries, and find some uh, nice properties. So, yeah. As I mentioned, uh, we acknowledge that we lose the information, but we are still curious, like, what kind of, of information we lose. And the one is the, yeah, comes about types because this is probably the most interesting part uh, when you do analysis as a security person because, uh, yeah, what I observed, people look for th things like, okay, find all the members named a length and see if, if this length can be uh, controlled by something and if this length is participating in the malloc calls, for example, because then you can probably exploit the stuff. So with the names of the structs itself, uh, of the types, uh, they are there. Some, like most of the time, they are in place and uh, they available. But we definitely lose the names of the members because for LLVM, it just doesn't matter. It's just like indices, uh, 0, 1, 2, whatever. But we still can look at the debug information and uh, if, if it's present, of course, and attach the right names for structs. But that's certainly not the case for unions. Because at the, at the source level, we kind of have two, uh, two members of a union, but at the LLVM level, it's just like one, one field, like with one property. And it, it's always, uh, so from the call, like to get element pointer, it's index zero. We cannot know uh, whether it was using the A or B in this example. Yeah, the other part that was, uh, a bit surprising, uh, not unexpected, uh, but the ABI uh, plays a huge role in this, uh, in this conversion. So at the source code level, we have a, a function that takes a struct as a parameter and returns a struct. And if uh, on this, the CPG level, if you want to run a query, okay, find all the functions that return the struct, what's its name, color, then you'll not find anything because of the LLVM level, it returns void, and instead it takes two, two structs as the parameters. Yeah, and it, it, it gets even worse uh, with different types, because in, in this example, these are all doubles, and they are kind of passed as a single thing, as, as a struct, uh, but if we change that to integers, then because of the, again, uh, of the ABI of this specific platform, you don't even have structs. So there are just like two numbers, and, and that's it, they are then kind of decoded by the machine. Another part, uh, surprising one, was the constants, and it's actually uh, by far the biggest problem. So if uh, here in the, in the function main, we define locally a constant that holds a number of pointers to some, uh, some functions, uh, at LLVM level, it will be a global variable. And uh, global variables are not very nice when it comes to the data flow tracking and uh, code analysis because uh, you can do like intra-procedural uh, analysis and it's kind of small because you have just one function. But if you need to also analyze the global variables, then you have to find, okay, 
who may write to this, who may read from this, uh, are there any aliases and so on. It just, the search space explodes and that gives us like really hard times to, to get it right. Uh, yeah, just as a workaround so far, uh, there's just, we are kind of whitelisting some uh, edge cases like this and uh, making them, basically putting them back like locally in the, in the function. But it, it's not a universal uh, solution, unfortunately. Yeah, this is the, uh, the other parts, like the big, so far like the biggest problem, uh, well, not the biggest, but one of the big problems that I just faced uh, several weeks ago. Um, in source code, you can define a type in a, a struct, uh, in a header, like struct, and then you include this uh, header into two different compilation units. Then you compile them both differently, and at the LLVM level, you have two bit code files that uh, have types like struct point and struct point uh, in the other module. If you load them in the, into the same context, then LLVM must uh, rename those to avoid collisions because basically the types are stored in just like map, basically, like key, key value storage. And apparently uh, there is no good solution for that. Uh, so we want to deduplicate these types, but there is no way to do it at least uh, currently in the using LLVM uh, built-in things. So this is one of the examples why it doesn't work, uh, because in LLVM uh, types are considered equal if they point to the same uh, object, basically. So all the types, they are allocated on, on the hip, and uh, if you have two different contexts and you ask two different, like two floats, they are, I mean, they are the same type, right? But LLVM considers them to be different. So. Uh, the first attempt to solve this problem was to use the function called isLayoutIdentical. You can just run it on, on a struct and it says yes or no, but uh, it doesn't work. So the structs on the left, they have identical layout and uh, yeah, it's all correct, but on the right, LLVM does not consider them to be identical because this function just uh, checks that all the members, they, they have the same type. But in fact, so in my opinion, it's like, it's under-implemented uh, in the base case. That should not be like that, or it should be renamed to, like, is members identical? That would be more valid thing. So we discovered it uh, much longer in the implementation and had to, had to find some other solution. And the solution that we uh, used uh, that also didn't work well, the IR linker, or also there is a command line tool called LLVM link. So basically, uh, it just tries to combine uh, two modules and to eliminate uh, as much types as possible. So in this case, it works perfectly because there is just one type point left and we can use it. But uh, in, in this case, if you have two different, uh, like, two different types from the user point of view, like points and tuple, but they have the same layout, uh, one of them will be eliminated and so basically we're losing even more information. So, yeah, don't, don't I would suggest don't, you don't use IR linker if you want to uh, preserve the type information or be careful. Because uh, what it also does, it may just screw the types in a way that uh, there may appear a type that just was never, like, never existed in the, in the high level uh, thing. Of course, you should not rely on this information and so on, but still, uh, we want to rely on this. So, our attempt to solve the type, uh, type deduplication problem was uh, inspired by uh, tree automata and ranked uh, alphabets. So basically uh, a ranked alphabet is just a set of symbols and each symbol has a number of parameters. You can think of it as like functions. And you can combine those functions to form a trees and this is where the tree automata comes in and each tree can be represented as, uh, as a string, like single string. So then our task to just encode the types uh, into such trees, com convert them into the strings, and yeah, th then, then basically we, uh, we compare the, the thing. So the next part I wanted to show you, I, I tried to put it on the slide, but it just like doesn't fit. I will try to explain it a little bit. So it comes, uh, yeah, it, it's about Objective-C 
So that was that was actually very easy to like the, the easiest part was to recover the information from Objective C because it's all there in the bitcode. Um, but there are some quirks like yeah should have should have found a nice picture for that, but I didn't. Yeah, so I'll I'll try to, to explain using this example. So in Objective C each each class has a super class and a meta class. This is the by definition. And uh, a meta class of a class is the meta class uh, itself. And the parent class of a meta class uh, might be either some other meta class or might be the class the, that defines this object like in, in the first place. So it's, it's, it's very mixed. Um, yeah, just mentioned that part. Mm. Yeah, I think it was it went faster than, than I expected. I uh, probably miss, missed some something. Yeah, I, I'll just uh, say what I missed to say before. Um, so one of the big big problems in this case or uh, of, of big issues uh, because the CPG thing, it has kind of two users. Uh, two, one is explicit user, a human being that is sitting and running those queries. And the other user is the data flow tracker. And this is where we, we just don't have the right, uh, I mean, there is no right answer like what to do. Because in LLVM, if you run uh, optimized, uh, if you optimize the bit code and you load it into the CPG, then you get much smaller thing. And uh, data flow tracker is much more happy about that. But as a user, you basically, again, you lose the information and you cannot work with this. With, with this. So this is, uh, yeah, one of the kind of dilemmas that, that we have. So our next steps uh, for, for this project are basically to, to make it stable and uh, to add more languages, like more features from, so, from some other languages. I don't know, like Rust, Swift, Fortran. Uh, we, the other part that uh, we are kind of started, started working on, but uh, not, not, not there yet, is we want to hook back into the Clank, into the AST, and uh, just basically extend the, the bit code, like the CPG representation that we have on the, based on the bit code, so that we don't really rely on the debug information, because it's not, uh, it's not as nice. It doesn't always work, uh, especially if you have different versions of uh, LLVM and different versions of compilers, and so on. Yeah, and the other part that uh, we want to analyze more projects and to, to get some results, because so the original work on the core property graphs, uh, the Fabian actually, the colleague who couldn't join, uh, they analyzed the Linux kernel and they found some vulnerabilities that were not uh, known before that. So we want to kind of try, try to do it with some uh, other projects. So. Um, yeah, some, some resources, if you're interested, I do recommend you to check out Yorn. Uh, it's free, open source and such. There is also Ocular, it's a commercial product. Um, but yeah, maybe uh, you are interested uh, in it at your company. So I did not talk, um, oh yeah, type equality. So I, I wrote down this the thing. Um, I think I would be happy to actually contribute it back to LLVM, but I, I still have feeling that it's a bit uh, too complicated and over-engineered. So I'm kind of trying to get some feedback from LLVM folks, and it's not really successful so far. So if yeah, if you have some comments, please uh, be my guest. Yeah, the last point uh, it's the link to to the other talk that uh, is more general, like how you build tools uh, based on LLVM. It's uh, yeah, given at your LLVM, it's based on my experience building such tools. So I decided not to cover the same parts in this talk and just to refer the other one so that I don't repeat myself. Yeah, so I think you will get a longer break after this talk. So if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, I would be happy to answer them. Thanks. Questions in the front? Yeah, please. Um, just, uh, do you have any figures of the performance to generate the CPG for, I don't know, uh, based on the, uh, the, line, the number of lines of code of some uh, product? Like yeah. You said the Linux kernel. How much time did it take to generate the actual final CPG or something like that? 
so the question is, uh, how much time does it take to generate CPG for some, some projects? So, yeah, uh, generally it depends on the front end, but for LLVM to CPG, I can say that for, uh, I tried it on Blender, which is quite big, but it wasn't a full project, uh, and it was taking on, I think on this machine, like roughly 15 minutes. And we also did it on the uh, uh, macOS kernel, and that was also like about 15 minutes, uh, just, just to get this thing. So, yeah, it's, it's reasonably fast, I would say. Um, so, I assume you there know that a malloc is something that allocates memory. Um, yeah. You essentially know what all of the system libraries do. And could you take a project and basically query, does this use any networking? So to verify that some random project you're going, um, pulling down the uh, internet is not sending anything on the wire. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as an example, uh, yeah, the question is, uh, if there are some, some way to find some, some patterns right in the code, can I say it yeah, like this? Um, so, or find or like. Specifically, the idea of pulling something that you don't know about and saying, does this. Yeah, well, what, what does it do? Like, yeah, to, to mining some properties of this program, like, yeah. does it send network requests? Does it allocate memory? And so on. Yeah, so uh, I think it boils down to two things. So I'll get back to this. Uh, yeah this thing first. So this is the uh, command line interface. It's like very similar to SQLite and it's basically the Scala. So first of all, one can write scripts in Scala interfacing with the CPG, with the database and uh, having those queries. For example, uh, if, if you have some domain specific, so this is what our security team does actually. Uh, there are projects like kernels and uh, some drivers, they don't necessarily have, I mean, they use malloc uh, sometimes, but uh, sometimes they have just some wrappers around those mallocs. So they kind of annotate the functions of interests uh, manually, and then they run some queries, okay, show me those, uh, those functions. And the, that's, that's one part, so it's, uh, it's technically possible. So there is no, uh, I mean, if, if you ask me now to, to check if there are network requests, there is no such thing, but it's technically possible to build. And this is where this, the overlays uh, come in. Yeah, as I said, they're domain specific. So we have, in fact, a number of uh, overlays for Go language uh, for web applications specifically, like show, like find all the routes, uh, all the API uh, endpoints in this application. So just as an example. So if I have a program that, I don't know, say Emacs, yeah. I could annotate functions that say this can put something in a buffer and then this one is affected by X global variable and go, can we, can we find me the functions that can <coughs> this global variable eventually put something in a buffer or change y Yes, yeah, so generally you can do it. Uh, it. It depends on the scale and size, but yeah, generally. So uh, I, I've uh, yeah, this, shown this example from the demo. So this is basically what happens here. So it's very like simplified, like sim the most simple example. Uh, so our security guys, uh, they, are, they are doing some like really crazy stuff with it and I just not able to reproduce it. But this is, this is basically what you do. You define <coughs> one part, you define the other part and then you find like some, some connections. Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, thank you. Um, please. Um, I have two questions about uh, tech retrieval for CPG. Uh, the first is how do you handle things like uh, variadic template render? Uh, so that's the beauty of LLVM because we don't really have to uh, take care about that because uh, yeah the, the question is how do we handle variadic templates and such in uh, in our case so because we work on the LLVM bitcode level uh, this information kind of encoded into the uh, signature uh, into the name of the uh, function or method so what like in this case currently what we do only just demangle this name so that uh, users can see something reasonable. But, I mean, it's like we have all this information in the string already, so we can parse it, we can rebuild the whole uh, template thing, but it just, yeah, no one asked for that. Yeah. I, I, I ask because I work on a CPG that has this issue where we want to retrieve more common information about the proper expansions. Um, uh, the, the other question I had is um, how do you deal with things like a cost erasure in the LLVM type system? So, like, I might want to ask whether or not a variable um, uh, has, uh, you know, constant at compile time that might be plausibly violated by some uh, memory access at one time. Uh, but LLVM doesn't represent the kind of thing inside of LLVM type. So, how do you um, 
So, yeah, the question is how do we handle the constant types in... Uh, Are there ratios accepted by the LVM types? Yeah. Um, yeah, so far I think we don't have any, any special uh, treating for that. Uh, if it's, I mean, it's, it's the global variable, right, normally, and uh, there is no great support like by the specific of the CPG uh, because of the space, uh, space explosion. So, I mean, it can be implemented, we just didn't get there. But uh, so far for, um, yeah, I think in most of the cases uh, when we are interested in the global variables, uh, these are either function pointers because it helps for the uh, data flow resolutions uh, or the constant, like string constants, for example, so that a user can see that, okay, these are the strings are used and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if I understood correctly, this is uh, a data structure helping with static analysis. Is it possible to compare that with something like the Clang static analyzer or is it just so completely different that it's incomparable? So you can compare that, I think, to a certain extent. So th this tool is more uh, in its, uh, like in a nutshell, it's, it's more like user driven. So, uh, and I think the, the audience of this tool is uh, security teams like red teams, blue teams who analyze the code. Uh, and we don't really have such checks, uh, the same checks that Clank uh, Analyzer has. Because, I mean, because there is Clank Analyzer and it's just, you can already use it. So there are other tools. Yeah, but we can do it. Um, sorry, that was a question. Back. Yeah, so on this question of struct types being equal or not, um, I'm kind of wondering because in the end, if you have two struct types that have the same shape, you can basically always replace one for another. So do you know, or does anybody else in the room know why LVM works like this? Why doesn't it automatically deduplicate struct types? Is that a conscious decision, design decision at some point? Or has it just, is it just a random maximum of history? Yeah, uh, so the question is more uh, open to the community. So why uh, does LLVM not deduplicate the types uh, by default? So I, I don't have an answer. The, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's an answer for the, the question was, which was raised. Uh, maybe because uh, in some cases uh, when your structure is super complicated, uh, it's indecidable or it's super complicated to have an algorithm which can decide whether two structures are equal uh, from a layout point of view. You, you designed a solution which relied on some graph and uh, layouts to recursively check if um, two structures are the same. There, there may be edge cases when you use some unions, some GCC extensions or Clang extension where uh, this thing is not going to work because you're relying on obscure, obscure uh, features which mm -hmm. are not disabled by at compile time. Yeah, okay, the, the question is... Uh, yeah, it's not, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I still can, can comment on that. Uh, there is another approach to that. Uh, so first of all, in our case, we don't really use the uh, layout equality to decide, but we kind of use the structural equality. So that if a struct, uh, so the, so the struct, if, if you draw the structs as a graph or as a tree, they must have equal shape. So this is our definition of equality. And uh, there is another uh, approach. I think it's called like based on Hopcroft's uh, DFA minimization algorithm, I think at least my colleague told that this is what IR linker does or it looked to him that this is what IR linker does and there is also some other, uh, I think, uh, scheme project that they do this, uh, they use this algorithm. But it, it uses different uh, equality thing. So we, uh, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't fit, fit our definition of equality. So this is, this is why we do it uh, the other way. So there are two questions. Um, yeah. Um, I wonder how these, these, this type um, the application thing. Uh, how does it handle pointers? Does it just treat all pointers the same, or does it take the time for the pointer to be type and compare them? Yeah, so it, it doesn't treat pointers as the same. So that's the point. And to, to avoid uh, recursion, so basically uh, when we build this tree, we rename, uh, we don't take names into account. We just rename uh, all the structs. Uh, we just give some, them some ID, like numerical ID. So and basically, if you if you see the struct that you already seen, like recursive case, you just emit. Okay, this is the same uh, struct, and we don't emit anything further. So it kind of 
So it's a graph and we convert this graph to a tree, so there is no recursion in this case. Yeah, okay. there was. I think, sorry, just to interrupt, I think that answers my question, because in currently pointers in LLVM still have a pointy type, even though conceptually the idea is to get away from that. Once pointers are opaque, that problem just disappears. It becomes trivial because you no longer have forward references, right? And then you could deduplicate by default because, but because historically pointers have pointy types, it's a problem. Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah. There is uh, just uh, just another comment. There is a write-up by Chris Latner that was uh, about type system uh, change around LLVM tree, and the, there are some some good points on why this the type system the way it is currently. Yeah, there were some questions here and one there I think. Yeah, please. Yeah, so the question is uh, when we get the bytecode, it's optimized, and how we get back to the source code. So it's not necessarily optimized. It's up to the users uh, how, to, how to emit this bytecode. It can be like totally unoptimized. And uh, to get back to the source code, we can only buy uh, the mean of debug information, because all the instructions with the debug information, they have a notion like where they came from. And uh, yeah, we can basically reconstruct some interesting parts. We can just look back at the source code at the AST and, and see what's, what's in there. I yeah. have one more question. Yeah, the like, last question. That was one, I think. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so the question is why, like, basically, why don't we use the SSA form, uh, right, and uh, kind of invent some something else? So we have some debates uh, in the team about this once in a while as well. But uh, so basically, historical reasons. So the tool was first built for, uh, I think, with Java in mind, uh, and this this is the format, uh, yeah, the way it is. And we have a number of front ends supporting different languages like C Sharp, Python, Go, and such. And uh, I think by now only LLVM has this SSA form in this like pure SSA form. So if we want to use SSA form, we would have to change all the other languages, which is yeah quite an effort. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.